That's true, Dr. Zayas. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Because we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show, Greg Carwood and Company. All right, higher side chatters to unlock the deepest levels of the elite's mindset, their desires, philosophy, and secret religion. It's not an easy thing to do. Sources are scattered, sometimes contradictory, and often contain both esoteric and esoteric meanings that add even more confusion to the mix. But it does seem like their deepest motivations revolve around goals like jailbreaking our construct, evolving man as they see fit, and manifesting an ancient agenda passed down through long-lasting bloodlines and secret groups behind the curtain. That said, occasionally something claws out of the zeitgeist to grab the attention of those seeking these very answers, and one such instance was what's known as the Hidden Hand Dialogue, where in 2008 a self-described member of the ruling class, appendage of the Lucifer soul group, and associate of an ancient order, anonymously arrived at the above top secret forum and offered to have an open and honest Q&A as part of a task he was given by his masters. What resulted was a near book-length back-and-forth that spanned over five sessions and introduced some perspectives I've had rattling around upstairs ever since I first heard them almost a decade ago. Well, folks, you might remember a Higher Side Chats episode from earlier in the year with elite belief system decoder extraordinaire Michael Joseph, where we explored this secret religion of the elite and its influence in society through the lens of Michael's occult science series on his YouTube channel Schism206. Since that time, he's added roughly 20 more hours of content to the series, which is now considered complete at 91 videos spanning 30 chapters. It's one hell of a watch, and I brought him back to talk about some of these conclusions and see how they compare to that early staple of internet conspiracy lore, the Hidden Hand Dialogue. So let's do the damn thing. Michael, my man, welcome back to the higher side. Thanks, Greg. Good to be here. Yeah, man, this is going to be great. I'm, I'm really psyched. I really liked the last one, and of course, I wanted to have you back. And so when I was trying to think of creative ways to cover these themes again, we talked about focusing a show on that hidden hand stuff because some of it resonates with the research you've done. And I just thought it would be different because I don't get to cover a lot of things that don't come from someone's latest book. But looking back at it, it doesn't seem quite as credible as it did at the time, though it is still intriguing material to compare and contrast to what you've researched elsewhere. And I guess to get us in the mindset, to really lay the base, remind the people about your research and how you've gone about trying to untangle this esoteric web. Sure. Well, the fundamental, I guess, sources for the whole occult science series and everything that I've done is basically looking at authors like H.P. Blavatsky and Albert Pike as more of the primary sources But as the series went on, I definitely used Blavatsky because within Secret Doctrine and Isis Unveiled, there's, you know, a couple thousand pages and there was a lot of stuff there. And then more peripherally or secondary, just kind of utilizing writings of Manly Palmer Hall, Eliphas Levy and Aleister Crowley. And again, the whole reason for that is because the United Nations is more or less openly following Blavatsky. I mean, it's still kind of hidden. Not a lot of people know about it, but through the Lucius Trust organization and on their website, which is part of their nonprofit, that's like their spiritual foundation. So it's pretty much based on theosophy. And of course, we talked about last time the U.S. government and its connections to Scottish Rite Freemasonry and NASA. And of course, everyone knows about Crowley and the influence in the entertainment industry. And then I kind of throw the Vatican in with that because there's guilt by association where they intermingle with all those groups in one way or another. And so that's kind of where I draw my understanding of occultism. Now, if people out there think that, you know, that's not what occultism is about or whatever, it doesn't really bother me. The point being is that, you know, a lot of the groups that people would generally target as part of the NWO, this seems to be what they're saying that they're following. So that's where I'm coming from. I feel like that's the best insight that us profane folks (laughs) can get into their world. And, you know, as I've gone through it, it's just amazing to me how much I see that has some pretty profound connections. And 
not to be too long winded, but when I first started the occult science, it was really going to only be like six, seven, eight videos. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden it just spiraled into this whole other thing. And now it's finally done and I'm glad, but there's a lot there. So that's where I'm at with it. There is, man. And the depth that you've gone into on some of these little sagas and stories is just really, really impressive. And you mentioned the Lucius Trust. I had another couple of guests who've mentioned them in passing recently, but maybe you could tell us a little more about them and their influence and culture and where we see it. Because, of course, there's think tanks like Bilderberg, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission. We hear about them. We hear about Skull and Bones. We hear about Freemasonry. But we don't hear quite as much about the Lucius Trust, but why are they important? Well, there's not a ton of information about them other than their website, but early in the series, and we might have talked about this last time, the Rockefellers you know, laid the foundations for the United Nations, and the Lucius Trust was located at their plaza for a while, I believe. They switched locations or something, but... It is interesting that you can see so much of the symbolism in the UN logos and then the Rockefellers with the Twin Towers and their Prometheus statue, Atlas statue. Right. You know, all of these things are important concepts in theosophy. So when you go to their website, the Lucius Trust website, you know, there's a lot of stuff about bringing in the age of Aquarius and the... Christ consciousness that is a fact, according to them, that can be indwelling in people. So, you know, it really is the well that they're drawing from is esoteric philosophy, Gnostic, Eastern religions, things of that nature. So if that is driving the United Nations spiritually, the United Nations is, they have their hands in everything. And so I went through the series, it's pretty crazy how influential they are on a lot of stuff. So... Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's all there on their website. I'd advise anybody to go check it out. And in my series also, everything is sourced. And in any of the videos, there's a link below that says, this is the references link. You just go there. It's a little Dropbox, but in there, there's a PDF file with the references. You click on that and everything is all laid out. And you can click on any of the links to go to anything. So there's a ton of information in the references. So I just want to make sure that everyone knows that Everything I'm saying has a source. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, so I mean, you can just see the occult influence when you look at their mission statements and their website and that kind of thing. And it's quite telling, especially when you know the source material, like the Blavatsky, Albert Pike stuff that you've read through so intensely. And so when it comes to the aspects of what this hidden hand guy had said that are interesting... Probably the main thing is this claim that his bloodline isn't an earthly bloodline. Someone asked him about the Rothschilds, and he said that they're just the foot soldiers on the lower level of the big pyramid compared to where he's at. But regardless of the validity of his individual claim, what has uh, your research shown regarding elite bloodlines and their origins and the possibility of some non-human sources in there? Yeah, this is tricky because... When I read Theosophy and Freemasonry, like in Morals and Dogma, it's weird because there's a lot of institutions that are, when we think about the New World Order and all this stuff, we think about like, oh, the government and, you know, the religious institutions and mm -hmm. politics and stuff like that. Right. And it's very strange because when you read a lot of this literature, you find that a lot of the enemies that the truthers target are actually enemies of Freemasonry and theosophy. And that's something that's really hard for me to reconcile that outside of just some basic theological constructs. But for example, I think we did talk about this a little bit last time, but Albert Pike kind of shits on monarchy and politics and even democratic or republic politics and I think it's in the like the third chapter of Morals and Dogma. It's called The Master. I think he lays out a lot of his disdain for politicians and governments and things like that. And also, they don't seem to like the Jesuits very much, which is interesting to me because that's a big target in a lot of the conspiracy circles. And Blavatsky definitely has, you know, a lot of, well, I guess anti Abrahamic religion, but specifically targeting a lot of Judaism. So, 
this is really where you have to get into the esoteric versus exoteric because anybody can say, oh, it's the Jews or, oh, it's the Jesuits. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Right. You know, and to me, there's an esoteric and exoteric layer to all of these things. Every single religion has it. And so to me, what really binds them is the esoteric religion. So it doesn't matter if they say I'm an atheist because Blavatsky is always complaining about how people mistake all of these Eastern traditions for being atheistic. So again, this is the veil that they use to disguise these secrets from the profane. And we can talk a bit more about, you know, the veil of ISIS and what that entails as far as I understand it. So I can't remember exactly what your original question was. I kind of went off on a tangent. Oh, just bloodlines. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyways, the bloodline thing, this is interesting. You know, if they don't like monarchy, to me, that's, being demeaning towards an earthly bloodline, if you will. So I think what they look at as a bloodline, at least from the hidden hand perspective that would align with stuff that I've looked at, is more of the consciousness of what they call, you know, the adept, the one that has been illuminated or is in the know, whatever you want to call them. I think it's more the idea that they have a consciousness that's alien or otherworldly and not of this earthly realm. And that is why they have so much symbolism and doctrine casting, you know, the lower material world as profane, and that's all of the square, right? So it is interesting how when they say bloodline in the hidden hand, it seems like it's being more utilized in a spiritual sense. Yeah. And I guess before we get too much further into this, I'll just talk a little bit about the hidden hand and what I kind of get from it. Sure. You know, there's definitely some times where I'm like, okay, this sounds very hoaxy to me. You know, the failed predictions of some ridiculous statements and stuff like that. But right. I guess to me, the value in discussing it here is there is quite a bit that does align with what I've been through. And so regardless if that is a hoax or not, I think it still has value. And it's similar to me in the vein of the Protocols, the Elders of Zion or the Albert Pike World War Three letter, you know, are those hoaxes or not? But there is some strange parallel to a lot of things going on when you read through those things, especially the protocols of Zion. When I read through that, that was creepy, man. I don't have you ever read that whole thing? Not in its entirety. I read enough quotes to see that disturbing, eerie coincidence that you're talking about. Yeah. So I chalk it up to being along the lines of that where there's definitely things noteworthy of discussing, but the actual source could be a hoax and probably is. I don't know. That's what I get from it. But I don't know what your take on it is. I mean, yeah, I, I'm pretty much in agreement with you. But it's those elements that do seem to have some merit that I wanted to dig into a little bit more. But on the subject of or the possibility of them having a, a non-human source in there, when you really get into the details of some of the work that you've done around the layers of symbolism and astrological meaning behind major seemingly orchestrated events like the JFK assassination or the Apollo missions, you start to think that it's like too layered and too detailed for human hands almost, that it almost has to have some cosmic puppet master influence because some of these events unfold as if someone is painting a picture with reality and symbols. I'm absolutely there with you. Once I started looking at all this stuff, I'm just like, there's no way that this could all be done by just humans, you know, right. just wanting power and stuff like that. There's just way too much stuff going on. And to me, again, it's this esoteric religion that binds them. And to me, there's something to be said that when you have a certain mindset or worldview, you're sharing a similar consciousness. You know what I mean? There might be some things here and there that differ. Right. You know, I, I kind of look at it like my relationship to whatever you want to call it, the truth or world. Where it's like, yeah, there's a lot of things that go on in it that I'm not really a huge fan of, but I'm still part of that general mass consciousness that something is wrong and we're not being told things that are true. Mm -hmm. And I think that we all, for the most part, can kind of agree that what is manipulating these things is not very good. Although I have had some strange reactions to the Occult Science series where people say that they think they actually agree with the elites based on my series. So ah. I, I've had so many different reactions. It's really crazy. It's interesting. And hey, that's that's that was my whole point. Hey, if that's what you want to think, that's what you want to think. You know, I don't want to try to convince anybody of anything. Right. You do a great job of trying to just be impartial. And that's fairly unique in this realm. And 
In terms of their motivations for what the elite do, the Hidden Hand says a lot of things that sync up with some Gnostic perspectives. For example, he says, Yahweh, due to the fact that he had not handed down his own free will to know thyself to those incarnating upon his planet, it was having very little evolutionary progress therein. So we, the Lucifer group, were sent to help. Once the order was given from the Council of Elders, we, quote, fell or descended back to a place where we could, with hard work and focus, once again materialize a third density manifestation of ourselves. In the absence of free will upon the planet, there can be no polarity and therefore nothing to choose between. Just as it is portrayed in the book of Genesis with the Garden of Eden, sure, it was a lovely paradise, but these beings incarnating there had no aggregator towards evolving beyond the third density, and therefore little hope of ever making the journey home to the One. Yahweh has been happy to keep his own little pet Eden project in effect, but with little chance of the souls here making it home, it had become, in effect, a prison. Albeit a very beautiful prison, Yahweh was running a benign dictatorship. And that's really interesting. Of course, that's something I got from Gnosticism generally. Of course, a lot of things are considered Gnosticism. There's many different perspectives there, but that one is kind of one of the core things that unites that corpus of material. But what are your thoughts on this justification for the elite's injection of negativity and struggle on the planet? You think it holds any water? <laughs> well, let's just say that I'm not a huge fan of that philosophy, not just what you just stated there with the hidden hands perspective, but it is very parallel to a lot of what Blavatsky talks about in specific ways. So one figure I talk about a lot is Prometheus and Blavatsky has a lot to say on Prometheus and I've read through this chapter so much I can remember it. I should tell people to go check out Anthropogenesis Volume 2, pages 409 through 422. And that is really kind of like the crux of a lot of the series and sort of what I'm applying to is the elite's take on the figure of Prometheus. And this is similar to what you just read from The Hidden Hand, where it's this idea that humanity was in this basic state of ignorance and kind of like a blissful ignorance, I guess. Right. And the whole point of Prometheus stealing the creative fire from the Elohim or the gods or whatever, or the Olympic Zeus, the tyrant Zeus, as she would call him. And that's the demiurge Zeus, right? That's the exoteric one. So that's essentially, you know, the Yahweh or Jehovah figure. And that giving this to man basically infused him with a divine intellect, but he's in this profane body. And so this is what causes all of the suffering. And this starts the cycle of necessity or karma or whatever. And this is for the purpose of evolution. And that talking about like the idea of Saturn, where, you know, people will associate Saturn with sort of the demiurge or whatever in the negative sense. But in the esoteric sense, Saturn is simply this equilibrator. So the function, the proper function of this, you know, kind of demiurge figure that is blessing and cursing or whatever, she basically talks about how the esoteric version of Shiva, that is the primordial archetype of Jehovah, and that the Bible kind of anthropomorphized it and bastardized it and just made it the highest God where that was just this active male force and part of that is the creative force and how it manifests it basically breaks things down and rebirths them in a more spiritual form over time and that is part of this process of moving towards equilibrium everything needs to be equilibrated all these polarities need to be equilibrated and then that is what is their essence of deity basically there is no good or evil no light or dark it's just this unity, and that's their idea of God. And so we are going through this cycle of ascending back up to that, something along those lines, and that that was the the function of Shiva. And so that's pretty interesting how that's a big figure in CERN. And I pretty much associate Shiva to the functions of Pluto and astrology, kind of breaking down structures and rebirthing them and whatnot. And it's the, the active force. And that's kind of what she talks about in that chapter. And then 
there's so much in that chapter. I don't want to go off on some huge tangent on it, mm -hmm. but I definitely recommend some people, if you're going to get one of Blavatsky's book, I think Anthropogenesis Volume 2 is one of the better ones if you want to get into like a lot of the mythology and what that means in terms of their viewpoints on human consciousness. Right. And yeah, that Prometheus, Lucifer archetype, the great gift giver to man motif that is popular with these particular figures. Something else that's been coming up with the other guests recently is that when you look at some of the symbols that seem to represent Lucifer Prometheus and you look deeper, they actually seem to represent Mithras in, in some weird way, like the statue at Rockefeller Center would be one example. And I'm curious if you kind of see that or if you see Mithras is representing something else. And maybe this is the esoteric, esoteric idea of, you know, what they're presenting publicly. But do you see a different meaning to that stuff? Or do you see it alluding to Mithras somehow and that conveying a different meaning? Yeah, Mithras is interesting because I have read some explanations on it, I think, from Manly Palmer Hall. And I wasn't really fully satisfied with it. So I kind of draw some of my own understanding, but also... Blavatsky talks about he's the ruler of the solar year. And this is kind of what the occultists do. They view everything as a whole or as one. And so in a year, you have spring, summer, fall, winter. And, you know, us profane people would think of them as separate or something like that. And so this is kind of the idea of Osiris and Set or something like that. You know, Osiris represents the spring and the summer and the productivity of this active male force. And then Set represents the dark half of it and, and murdering that. And then that's basically the fall starts in the fall, right? So the fall into generation or to, into darkness and then being reborn out of that, that's sort of like this wisdom that is taught. And so Mithras encompasses the solar year. That's what Levasky was talking about related to Abraxas. And all of this is unified through what they call the central or spiritual sun and this is something that the Hidden Hand talked about, the central sun. And that's the esoteric sun. So that's this androgynous, pure spirit. And then the exoteric is like the lower egoic, you know, demiurge god who's in duality, right? Mm -hmm. The idea is that this split polarity of summer and winter or whatever, it all came from the same unity. And so our current world is is unequilibrated, as she calls it. And that is kind of the goal of the adepts through alchemy is, you know, the staff of Hermes with the serpent separate, and then they synthesize again and separate. And you keep doing that process all the way up to perfection or whatever. And you utilize this active force. So that's why that staff is phallic or whatever. So this is the generative force that is the fire of Prometheus, essentially. And to me, Mithras is kind of like encompassing both where it could be representing this spiritual solar savior or sun that slays the bull. And if you want to utilize the bull as an allegory for like the lower nature of man or of the square, or the base desires and whatnot, because those are generally negative characteristics of the sign of Taurus. And so this is the idea that you're slaying your lower nature that's in duality and you're ascending to your higher nature. That's like one of the meanings that I think can be derived from it. And then, there's like a little serpent coming out of the ground. There's a scorpion like biting the testicles of the bull and stuff like that. And so that's like the fertility symbolism where they view sexual generation in terms of like the sex is separated, right? Polarities as sort of of the lower nature. So male and female separated is kind of like this bad thing. Hmm. And this is what Scorpio is about. It's it's the sign of sexual generation. So Scorpio is opposite Taurus on the Zodiac. And so the occultists look at these polarities on the Zodiac as being very intrinsically related to each other. So to me, Mithras slaying the bull is like the sun either coming into the constellation of Scorpio or Taurus because the opposite end of the Zodiac they view as like the spiritual sun. So if the sun is in Scorpio then the spiritual sun or the heliocentric sun, and this is what Manly Palmer Hall talked about a bit, would be in Taurus. So I think that they kind of, they play with these polarities and Mithras seems to be a hieroglyph that kind of encompasses all of these motifs and whichever way you want to take it, you know, apply it to the situation that makes sense. But 
that's kind of where I'm at with it. And again, I'm using some of my own understanding of it into that, but that's where I'm at. Right on. So, I mean, at least, uh, at least it seems like the archetypes of Lucifer, Prometheus, Mithras, they are thematically aligned either way, right? It's teaching divine wisdom. It's an initiation thing. And it's just understanding the true nature of good and evil according to them. Right. Whereas it doesn't really exist. It's polarity split in this world and in the higher heavenly realms. That's the pure spirit of Lucifer. It's an androgynous essence that, you know, transcends the material world. Right. And that was going to be another one of the things I was going to ask you about, because another foundational element to the, your research and the Hidden Hand material is the classic knowledge of good and evil tree of life story. And of course, then you have the perspective of what that means to the occultists. What do you think is important to understand about this at the deeper levels, that particular story and their esoteric meaning of it? Sure. Well, the knowledge of good and evil, I kind of focused on this a bit in the latter part of the series. And in terms of the hidden hand, it was pretty much directly in line with the philosophy. So the hidden hand was talking about how, you know, the knowledge of good and evil is just knowledge of polarities. And that is the knowledge that was given to mankind. Now what the hidden hand doesn't tell you that Blavatsky will talk about is that, again, this is just the true nature of good and evil. And I did a bunch of videos on like the garden of Eden and what Blavatsky says that that originated from. And I think she mentioned like 12 different things that it could mean. And it got a little ridiculous, but basically the story of the garden of Eden, according to Blavatsky, the coats of skin that Adam and Eve are clothed with, she says comes from some initiation ritual where if you understand the knowledge of good and evil, you got these skins when you're initiated into these societies. So they're saying that that understanding got mixed in to the Hebrew Genesis, which she says all this stuff comes from Eastern religion. And so all of the knowledge of good and evil as they view it just comes from the Eastern traditions. Now, again, I haven't read the Vedas and stuff like that. So I don't know what they actually say, because when Blavatsky goes through and says, oh, this passage in the Bible means this and that esoterically, I've read enough of the Bible to be like, you know, sometimes that makes sense to me. And sometimes I'm like, I don't know where the hell she's getting that from. It seems like they're just kind of pulling something out of their ass to make it fit. So I don't know if they do that with the Eastern traditions, too. So I'm not saying that this is what the Eastern traditions teach, but this is kind of what they say it teaches or they say it's the esoteric meaning of it. So mm. essentially, that's like the primordial spirituality, according to these occultists, that it all comes from there. And that if you understand that nature of good and evil, that essentially is this knowledge of good and evil. And that there is still wisdom in the split duality of it. And that's the point of the Old Testament God and their viewpoint, you know, Jehovah blessing and cursing and being what they call bipolar. You know, oh, I'm angry at Israel. I'm going to punish them. Oh, now I bless them, that kind of thing. They say there's still wisdom in that, but you need the esoteric books of the Kabbalah, you know, the Sefer Yitzhah, and I forget the other one. You need those to unlock the Bible in its 66 books. So that's what gives you the true understanding of the nature of good and evil. So it's just what the adepts know as esoteric wisdom and that the profane people think that evil is some separate entity. And, you know, the anthropomorphized devil, that's like the enemy. If you anthropomorphize God or the devil and you think it's something external than you, that is essentially what they view as a profane and flawed philosophy. And they think that that's part of all the problems of the world is that people don't understand these esoteric concepts. And so, you know, if we're going to worship dualistic gods, then that is going to be our own dualistic consciousness coming out. And you know, there is something to that, but I think that there's other things that go along with that. They kind of help that crazy come into the world, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, man. And I wanted to, of course, ask you a little bit about Lucifer and then talk about that knowledge of good and evil story and how to interpret it. Because in the big picture, 
it is hard to know if we live in the playpen of a tyrant or if this has just been hijacked by arrogant underminers of some kind of Yahweh entity or both. But one parallel that you did draw to what's actually going on in the world is the CRISPR gene manipulation technology and how it's being peddled as something that might be the answer to all our medical prayers. In fact, you're also hearing the philosophy being promoted that once the gene altering technology is perfected, it would actually be a moral obligation to alter or, you know, quote, perfect the genes of all the unborn, or we'd be doing them a disservice. And that is a creepy philosophy to be promoting. And mythologically speaking, it's effectively the same catalyst for casting down the fallen angels, messing with the genes of man through either sex or science. But you know, what does it matter which method? That is kind of what they did. But I found that to be a pretty interesting parallel, man. Yeah. Well, to kind of set the stage for that, the Lucius Trust website talks about the sons of God, which is basically the Genesis 6 sons of God, which in the Orthodox are very naughty. <laughs> These are the Watcher Angels and Enoch. Those are the good guys in esoteric philosophy. And those are the ones that give us this divine wisdom or this knowledge of polarities. And this leads to technology. So there is a technological component to this. And so what you were talking about before with like the CRISPR stuff, it is weird how they said that this could lead to moral issues where it would be inhumane not to modify human beings or even animals. Right. And this is interesting because in the Orthodox side of the story, the watcher angels or messing with human genetics, however you said, either by physically attaching themselves, I guess, through sexual intercourse or something else. Now, again, this is a mythology, so I like to be a little bit more liberal about the orthodox side and, and view it like the occultists do, where it's an allegory for human consciousness, because sometimes I think a lot of the literalism is the weapon to take us away from, I think, things that have value, at least in the orthodox viewpoint. But if you view them like the occultists do, as more modes of our human experience, I think that some very interesting things come up. So back to what you were saying, this is kind of the crux of transhumanism and the idea of avatars and how that relates to a lot of the stuff that I went over in Blavatsky's philosophy and how essentially these sons of God or the Kumaras of Shiva, you know, they're helping evolve mankind. And that is the crux of all of this transhumanist stuff. Oh, it's all evolution. We're just evolving. And then the interesting thing is this is evolving beyond all the polarities, right? Male, female, any division of race or nation or things like that. It's kind of like being all unified into one and you can be this android, right? Androgynous created body and this consciousness can be indwelling in it and that's part of the goal it seems in a lot of the literature that i went through not really outwardly they don't ever say like we are going to make a human body out of technology and blend spirit with matter they don't say that but the philosophy is there to support that and so yeah all that stuff you know it is weird to me and i don't know how much of that is just reality and they can actually do these things or they just they're, maybe they're being all new agey about it and oh if we just imagine these things they'll happen and they think that they can create their own reality but maybe they can't to a certain degree i don't know there's a lot of stuff that goes with that it's very strange as to what their actual level of technology is with all of this stuff but they seem to have very high hopes and aspirations for it if you watch any of the transhumanist stuff right and it is just eerie how overall a lot of mythology and religion describes that cycle of man claws up only to be stricken back down. And at the same time, a lot of people have the feeling that things are sort of coming to a head technologically, economically, politically. And it does make one wonder if we're nearing some reset of the cycle. Well, we could get into the root race cycles if you want, because that's a good segue. Absolutely. Let's do it. Sure. This is something that I had heard about, you know, with Blavatsky root race cycles. It's just something I kind of knew about in passing. But once I started reading about it, I think there's some very revealing things in it. 
and this does relate to the hidden hand in terms of, you know, that guy's or girl, I don't know, I'll just call him a guy, but his self proclamation that they've been steering humanity through evolutionary cycles over millennia, right? This would relate to Blavatsky's concept of root race cycles. And I just encourage anyone out there to just Google Blavatsky root race cycle and look up images and they'll show you the diagram and what I'm explaining now, you'll be able to see a visual representation of it. But this has very profound parallels to cosmology. It starts with a single point. That's like the creation of the primordial man, as they call it. And this is an androgynous spiritual man. That is the Adam Cadmon, as they call it. And what happens is this idea of this cosmic egg. We talked about this a little bit last time with the Big Bang Theory and George Lemaitre's theory of the cosmic egg and primordial matter. Now, this is directly tied to Kabbalistic doctrine. And it's this idea that Brahma is not the highest God, but is the original prototype of, I guess, what Jehovah should be to the occultist, whereas the orthodox viewpoint of Jehovah is just a bastardization of this father God. Now, this is what creates, but it's not the highest God. The highest God is just this essence. It's like Ein, Ein Sof at the top of the tree of life. It's outside of the creation. And some ray from this essence, it's kind of abstract, like hops into this cosmic egg and bursts it. And that is this single point of light in which the infinite deity manifested. And it's kind of like the idea of the infinite expanding universe, right? And everything was condensed in a single point and then let there be light, right? <laughs> and so mm -hmm. it's very parallel with the Big Bang. Now, some people have talked about the Big Bang as it wasn't a single point, but a lot of the theory, as far as I've read, does suggest a single point. So there is some debate on this, but there's enough of it that is out there in the mainstream that very much parallels this Kabbalistic story of creation. And so basically, at this single point, humanity is spiritual, the creation is spiritual, and it descends down this arc and goes down into more material nature. And Blavatsky puts it point blank that their theosophy, their viewpoint is panspermic, meaning life on Earth evolved from whatever, star stuff, you know, like we're told in science, right? And so it starts out as this androgynous spiritual essence. And then in Genesis, she says that in the Kabbalah of Genesis, this evolution is taught. And it's Darwinian in the sense that it's this natural selection, but she's saying that the materialism of Darwin has it wrong. And that's where the profane have it wrong, where man didn't come from apes and that's where it started. This spiritual essence came down and evolved through all of these different cycles from, you know, dust and stones and plants and trees into animals. And it split the sexes into sexual reproduction. And that's the animal nature. That's the lower nature. And then from the lowest point of this gross materialism, she calls it, that's when man starts evolving back up. So that's kind of where the Darwin picks up. And she's saying he misses the spiritual component of it. Or at least people who are the materialists of that viewpoint miss the spiritual component. Now, whatever Darwin thought about all this, if he was into this esoteric stuff or not, I don't know. But yeah, this root race cycle goes down and then comes up. And apparently at this point, at least in her writings, which are supposedly in the 1800s, late 1800s, we're sort of approaching this sixth root race, which is kind of a big deal. Because this goes above the original point of creation on this root race cycle. And fast forward to a couple hundred years, if we're approaching this, then this would be like a really important time for occultists. And she says that the initiates or the adepts, they only have the knowledge of these root race cycles. It's not for the profane. And so they're guiding humanity through this with all of this you know, secret wisdom behind the scenes, at least according to her, and it seems pretty in line with the hidden hand. And so this is why I think it's so strange. A lot of this stuff is coming mainstream, especially with this transhumanist stuff. They're always talking, oh, humanity is going to a new era. You know, we could go to an old dark age, right? And I know you've been talking a lot about the dark ages and if that mm -hmm. was even real or not right. with the Fomenko stuff. But 
they always use that thousand years of darkness is we can't go back to that. And now we got to evolve. And so if in their mind, we're coming back from the separation of sexes, you know, male and female, I'm a man, I have to have a woman to have sex with to reproduce. That's of the lower animal nature. And so as you move up, you go to bisexuality, and then you go to androgyny. And so this seems to be very relevant to a lot of the transgender stuff going on. And I know that's a sensitive topic, but I point out that a lot of this activism surrounding it seems to be this esoteric allegory for the concept of the spirit of Lucifer, this androgynous essence. Now, I don't care what anybody wants to do with their lifestyle or whatever, but if you're being used in an alternative agenda, I think maybe you'd want to know about that. So that's why I'm questioning what's going on with a lot of this activism around it. But that's the crux of the root race cycle. And they always talk about how an old cycle needs to die and that people who are stuck in that way are going to fight and resist it. And so this is very interesting because a lot of that is going on with this idea of the mass immigration and, you know, all the stuff with Brexit and all that. Well, you know, whatever your opinion on that, I'm not trying to debate this, but I'm just saying that that is a theme that's going on. And I wonder if this decline of the West or this killing of Western civilization is part of their concept of this root race cycle and it has to fall or something like that, because that seems to be very relevant to a lot of things going on. Mm hmm. Yeah, it gets a little confusing, but it is really fascinating and it is pretty deep. She gives pretty provocative names to these various root races. I mean, she calls the second one Hyperborean, the third one Lumerian, the fourth one Atlantean, the fifth one Aryan. And, you know, there's a lot of people who try to look back into antiquity and they consider these to be almost prior civilizations, Atlantis, Lumeria, Hyperborea, and perhaps they were. That is one thing that she doesn't seem to allegorize. She seems to indicate that, you know, Atlantis was this real thing. Now, there's a lot of reading in those books, and I haven't gone through everything. So I actually have to read a bit more on that. That's like one thing that I've kind of been waiting on. But that is involved with the hidden hand saying, yes, Atlantis was perfectly real. And, you know, there obviously seems to be something very profound with that. And there seems to me this idea that, there was this hubris surrounding the Atlanteans where it seems like they were kind of this idea of the Olympic Zeus, where it's it's kind of like Jupiter in astrology in a negative sense, where it can be self-indulgent and egoic and lazy and basically have everything handed to it and be destructive in that sense, like a big, fat, lazy king, something like that. And so I think that in some weird way, the Western world to them is it's almost like they're paralleling that. Now, I don't know how much that happens organically or if they're part of this root race cycle and they believe that these things repeat, have they had a hidden hand in trying to make the Western world like that? And that's where it gets kind of crazy. Right. And, and also, so, oh, oh sorry, sorry go, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm here all the time. <laughs> yeah, so this is why you have bloodlines like the Rockefellers and... Rothschilds and all of the ones that you would deem as even like the Bush family and stuff, they fit this archetype of this oppressive Zeus, I guess more like the Bush regime with, you know, oil imperialism and stuff like that. And that gets into this idea of are they playing a role as this bad guy, but they're working in tandem with the United Nations, which would seem to be like the antithesis of that, where they want all of this globalism and redistribution of wealth and stuff like that. And this is in line with occultism because they view these polarities as coming from the same source. And this is in line with the hidden hand. And so I'm just wondering if they create a straw man bad guy for us in a way that we can all point our fingers at these specific bloodlines, which the hidden hand is calling earthly or lower bloodlines. And we know that the occultists think anything of the earthly nature is profane. But are those guys playing a role and they're just best buds with the other side of that? You know what I mean? And so this idea of the Olympians oppressing the Titans and, and Prometheus is a Titan. And this is very relevant to the political system that we have, where the Republicans are like the Demiurge Zeus, these oppressive phallic force, right? The patriarchy. And then the liberal side is like the Titans who are oppressed. They have this divine intellect of love and humanity and giving and nurturing. 
and you know this is the side that wants to evolve gender and things like that and so it's almost like they set up these two pillars that they control both sides but it's based on this mythology and it's really strange and and there's so much going on right now with that with the trump thing and i don't want to get too long-winded on this but i'll just throw this out there really quickly mm -hmm. Have you looked at the economist Trump tarot cards that were released in the end of last year? Yes, but d tell us about the details there that you found most interesting because that is pretty awesome. Yeah, it seems like they're portraying Trump as the demiurge, basically Eyal de Beoth and Gnosticism, this lion serpent. And if you look at the judgment card, they placed him with an emperor card motif where the emperor, if it's a tyrant emperor, that's like the Olympic Zeus. And what is Trump's mo that people look at him he's like this you know capitalist he likes beautiful women indulging in finer things these are all these attributes of a sensual lustful god like the zeus that gets around and you know gets laid all the time that mm -hmm. exoteric version and then he's always been portrayed as like this lion's mane you know what i mean his head is like they'll have all these memes online of his lion face <laughs> he's got a mane all right yeah exactly and so that's the head of yal de Beoth. And then the serpent is the body, and they have him in black, in a black suit, indicating like Saturnian colors, self-devouring the lower serpent. And they have him on an American flag, which is shaped like a serpent, on the world. So it's kind of like the tyrant holding the humanity globe in bondage to its profane lower nature. And all this symbolism is Saturnian, things like that. And this is what I find is so interesting is that the occultist view this profane, dualistic nature as still wisdom. And this is what Blavatsky says were Gnostics who just think Yael the Beoth is this evil thing and want nothing to do with it. They're kind of profaning the mysteries where there's actually wisdom in this so-called evil or this lower nature, but you just have to understand the true nature of good and evil as its unity. So to be able to utilize an alchemy, and the last point I'll make, I know this is getting long-winded, but... If you look at Trump's tower, out front, they have black and gold and a clock, kind of like Saturn, Father Time. They have all this alchemical Saturnian symbolism of letter gold. And they had that with 9-11 with the Mecca Kaaba, where they have the black cube with the gold around it. And I think they utilize this black and gold motif for alchemy, and they push something into a profane Saturnian self-devouring motif. And then they unify the opposites from that. So that's what happened with 9-11. We have the imperialist West, the demiurge Zeus. And then we have the creation of these terrorists or, you know, the U.S. always funding all these terrorist groups behind the scenes. And that comes back to devour the West. You have this devouring nature of Saturn. But then the occultists utilized that and they unified the pillars of the, you know, the Twin Towers into a one world trade center. Right. And so I wonder if they have something up their sleeve with that for Trump because a lot of that alchemical symbolism is there. Yeah, man, it is definitely deep and interesting stuff. And I'm kind of curious because so much of your stuff is about mythology and astrology. And I've had a, an astrologer in the past come on and talk about how this great American eclipse coming is going to be very significant and interacts with Trump's natal chart in significant ways. But Given what you've looked at in astrology, do you have any thoughts or expectations in regards to the Great American Eclipse coming up or what it could represent or how it could be used? Yeah, I'm not good with eclipses and moon cycles and stuff like that. I, I have actually been studying it a lot more, but what I think is interesting is there's a Pluto-Saturn conjunction coming up in like 2020 or something like that. And the opposition was 9-11. That was Pluto opposite Saturn. And so now it's conjunct. So that's like, you know, you had the opposition or the polarity and now it's unifying. And so I don't like to predict things. Right, right. I'm not really in that realm. But, you know, obviously a lot of this stuff has a profound meaning to the elites. But I also think that if it's out there and people are talking about it a lot, I often think that sometimes that stuff, they give a version of it for us to kind of meddle with. Now, whether people are researching and organically coming up with stuff, that's different. But like, you know, the whole September 23rd thing a few years ago, there was much ado about that. It turned out to be nothing. Right. 2012, much ado about that turned out to be nothing in terms of how we were all portrayed. But to me, 
I think they view things are happening, but I think that they probably have a different understanding of it. And so, you know, again, this is kind of like their philosophy. They give the masses a lot of grandiose, overly exaggerated stories and stuff. And I think that that's what they think is the part of this veil to hide the mysteries where unfortunately <laughs> for some people who might be more into some of that stuff, a lot of this occultism I've been reading is it's very not magical in the way that most people would think. Blavatsky says, you know, channeling and using people as mediums and stuff, that's all profane in that like any phenomena can be explained through natural laws and things like that. And it's very non-magical in that sense. So it's it's very interesting how there's a lot of weird things that get mixed up with all that. So in terms of the Eclipse stuff, I just don't know enough about it, but I don't think that anything too dramatic is going to happen because that just seems to be how things work. And I think that when stuff dramatic happens, it's it's more out of the blue, but who knows? Fair enough. And I cannot argue that there uh, there's a long history of conspiracy enthusiasts getting worked up about a particular date or something and then nothing happening. But I'm... I don't know. We'll see. The eclipse is coming very soon, so we'll know uh, if it's significant or not. Yeah, sure. But towards the end of your series, you make some great points about solutions or at least ways to cope with this type of stuff. You mentioned the importance of personal connections so that we can actually see people as human beings and maybe try to see their perspectives. But I also like the parts where you talk about this theme of the elites pushing the envelope in terms of playing God and testing the limits in that dangerous Luciferian way, and that maybe we should focus on perfecting the situation within our limits before we try to exceed them. Something seems to be driving us ahead when we haven't even solved the basic problems of the human condition. But, of course, we can only do so much if we're not going to take control of the ship. Yeah, and, you know, that's something that's tough because I don't really have a lot of great solutions. It's it's really tough looking at all this stuff, and you're like, oh my god, it's it's just so ingrained. But if you look at the theology, as far as I've understood it and read it, their version of God seems to be this idea of something that's impersonal. And everything that is profane to them is this concept of a personal creator God. And again, I don't mean this in a way that we're accustomed to understanding that and the exoteric religion. We've been given a version of that. But, you know, maybe there is something going on around us that has some personal outer influence that is tailored to our individual situation. And you know, this is just something that I've had events happen in my life that have seemed to be very personally tailored to me. Some of them have been not so great, but some of them I maybe kind of deserved because I was being an asshole. You know, it's mm. sort of this karmic thing, but it's very strange because sometimes I see these things like, well, that person did that and this didn't happen to them, but I immediately <laughs> got that blowback, you know? And so this is kind of why I have a sort of an affinity with some ideas of astrology that really allow me to be a lot more sympathetic to other people's personal situations that I'm not really in control of some all encompassing judgment on somebody else. Now I can look at their actions and be like, okay, I'm not a fan of that. Or, you know, I like that. I do understand this and that about them. So I understand kind of more why they're like that. And I think that the more you understand somebody's background or perspective, I think the more you can actually help them and actually tolerate them in moments where you might want to just run out the door. And I think that that's something I separate from a lot of this doctrine where they seem to have a very impersonal look on people who are, I guess, in the matrix, right? It's sort of like, well, Kali Yuga is going to happen and you profane people are just going to have to sort that out. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, I just don't like that mentality. Right. And I see that coming out in some of the truther circles as well. And I, I, you know, I understand that because I get just as pissed as the next person about why people don't see this or that, you know? So it's, it's a fine line to tread, but it seems like that is their great enemy. This idea of this personal God that cares about people on that individual level. And sometimes I think there's wisdom and looking at these things and deriving what you think isn't God or divine or something that's a more spiritual way of looking at things that you think is profound. It's kind of like how they view the the polarities and knowledge of good and evil. There is wisdom there, but you got to read between the lines and perform your own unification of these opposites. And I think that that's what it is. When I see people acting in a polarized way, and a lot of times I do see myself like, okay, I've definitely done that before. Maybe not to the extreme level that they are doing it, 
or maybe I have done it even more extreme than somebody else. And, you know, you got to kind of differentiate what's projection and what's actually you being objective. But you still need to understand when you look at somebody objectively to understand their subjective viewpoint. I, I, that might sound overly philosophical, but I think you kind of have to have both. And this is what I relate to the Internet. That's their creation, you know, CERN creating the Internet. And with all of these things with data mining and this idea of creating this universal mind, the DARPA stuff, I kind of went over this in some of the later videos. And this is their idea of, I guess, the, the cosmic consciousness that we're all participating in. And this is very much in line with a lot of the hidden hand stuff. They talked about a lot of this. And so if they view something as humanity collectively as being very important, I think it's interesting that they try to utilize that with the internet where they're just data mining a lot of people's personal information, but they're looking at it very impersonally. They just want to look at what makes people tick and all these sorts of stuff mm -hmm. and then build their own AI based off of it. <laughs> at least that seems to be what they're saying. And, you know, to me, I always found it very strange when going on Facebook and stuff. I'm not on that anymore. I mean, I have the account. I just have it deactivated. I just can't deal with it anymore because you see people giving away personal information that you can see devoid of any puppet master controllers, just general people. I just see a lot of my friends, like these girls doing selfies of them in bikinis. I'm like, you don't realize how much of your insecurities you're projecting to people. And there are wolves out there that will take advantage of that. And they're going to play to your vanity. And then you get those relationship posts that some guy didn't work out because you realized he was a big jerk. But it's just like, well, what are you putting out there and what are you bringing to you? And there's this weird world of the internet where so much of this is public. And the internet just brings out so much impersonal shit in people where they don't view people as human beings and nothing is more true than comment threads, especially <laughs> on YouTube, where it's like you would never talk to somebody in real life like you're talking to those people in a lot of instances of what you see. And I found myself doing this. You know, I've been on debates online where I start oh, you know what, I'm going to refute this guy's point and show what an idiot he is. But why am I really doing that? I'm just trying to make myself, you know, it's just like, mm -hmm. what am I doing? And I find all this nasty shit coming out of me. And I'm just like, this is really impersonalizing things for me. And there's something really weird about the internet. And I think that it was created with a malintent at the beginning. And there's something about that, that we have to really struggle with, that it brings that out in us. And I think it is a useful tool, but if it starts breeding all of this impersonal behavior, we're just judging people left and right because they believe this or that, and we just don't even know them face to face as a person, there's something really dangerous about that. And, you know, that, that was just kind of my whole point with that, where to me, it's reflecting their version of God, where all this impersonal behavior is happening. And so that just, it's, it's very telling to me in a very philosophical way. And that's why I'm really trying to get away from engaging and online stuff, it's different when you, you know, you have a site and you have a forum and that's the basis of your show, connecting with people where, I don't know, for my own purposes, I'm trying to just leave it up to like, if people want to email me, they can email me, but I'm kind of done talking in comment threads because, you know, I just find a lot of bad stuff can escalate and it can give a lot of preconceived biases and notions to people. And, you know, I'm trying to go a different direction with that. And I guess to wrap up my point with this is, I'm thinking about going in a different direction with my channel to begin with hmm. and not really going through a lot of this research like I have been because, you know, everything that I presented, the, the fundamental concepts are there. You just take them and apply them to anything and you're always going to get a buttload of details manifesting from that that say the same thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, here you go, everyone. All these ways they're fucking with you and you didn't know it. Now you must feel pretty awesome that you might have been duped with this. You know, it's just so fucking depressing, but it's good to know the ways you might be being steered towards something you don't know. But at some point, you got to kind of quit that. And so I'm going to start, I'm getting more into studying astrology and maybe trying to pursue that and trying to take some of these concepts and all of these philosophies and try to perform my own alchemy on it in a way that, okay, what do I find profound? What do I think works? How can we use some of these things of their system, take out maybe the poison bits, you know, like planetary cycles, if they're obsessed with this, let me look at these and see if I can make anything that's more practical, less fatalistic. And I'm trying to go in that direction. I'm not exactly sure where it's going to go, but I kind of want to start giving more 
I don't know, of a positive, practical nature to some of the material. And I might go back to some of the research similar to the vein that I'm doing, but where I'm going now, I'm trying to reinvent it a bit. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work, but that last video where I just sat there and, you know, let some stuff loose, that was me being like, man, I want to just get away from this shit and transform it into something different. And so that's kind of the essence of that. Cheers, man. I definitely get why you would want to do that. And I think you make a good point about there being something to -to face-to-face interactions or something about that internet separateness. And I mean, it's kind of the same as driving, right? I mean, you wouldn't scream (laughs) at them or flip them off or anything if you weren't in this protective bubble of the vehicle. And I think that's the internet. It creates a protective bubble where we can really let our worst tendencies shine through. And uh, you were talking about all the devolving that's going on right now. I mean, everywhere you look, it's everything's completely polarized, black and white, left and right, male, female, gay, straight. It's pretty crazy that not long ago, all those groups were somewhat united in the Occupy protest against the 1%. And then just a few years later, we have all these same people who would have been involved in Occupy protests, but they're now protesting what? Like, other races, other sides, and everybody's lost sight of the elite and the unfairness and the inequality. And we were so close. We had it. Well, yeah, I don't know if you watched the videos on Libya and Occupy that I had where it's like, oh, God, the Occupy thing, it just... It screams manipulation to me from that. And you know, I'm not going to get into that. but It's true. It's true. It was at least more on target. Yeah, I guess what it was, was I talked about the symbolism of Mary crushing the serpent and how that's essentially a visual representation of the constellations of Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio. And that's a really important part of the sky in all of this and zodiac signs and Part of the sky, it's kind of a misnomer with like Western astrology. That's that's a whole other thing. But there's this idea that the virgin is this pure state of this spirit of Lucifer. Or what I mean by Lucifer is the reason they revere that is because they think that the Orthodox perverted the Eastern tradition's pure spiritual ideas. And then they made Lucifer the bad guy. So this is why the occultists use Lucifer as this archetype. But really... Lucifer just refers to the pure spirit of the Eastern traditions, according to the occultists. That's the main component of it. So this is what the celestial virgin represents. And then the Scorpio constellation, when Virgo and Scorpio split, Libra is inserted. And so the the lower nature is the serpent. And that's like the exoteric serpent. That's the serpent of generation, the, the sexual reproduction and all that kind of stuff. So it is interesting how the Occupy... They started it in the sign of Virgo, and the sun was in Virgo. And meanwhile, while that's going on, the Libya conflict is going on. And they use this archetype of the lower serpent, the the phallic male oppressor. And that, to me, is like the dictator, right? Dictator, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's that's the whole point of it. And then they say that Gaddafi is giving his troops Viagra, right? A phallic thing to go rape all of these innocent pure virgin women and children archetype so they're using these archetypes of astrology and then the occupy symbol was this ballerina on a bull conquering it and you know the bull again and the exoteric symbolism it's the profane lower nature it's the bull of wall street western imperialism the phallic nature all that stuff and again the bull is opposite scorpio on the zodiac so they're just playing with the same motif where this virgin goddess or this divine feminine conquering this serpent or conquering this bull. So they give us the Occupy version of that, where we think we're conquering Western imperialism. Meanwhile, the West is invading Libya. And like you said, all those groups that are protesting that seemingly are involved in all these racial Black Lives Matter issues later on with the Brexit stuff and all of that, you know, social justice stuff. Well, meanwhile, the entire continent of Africa, where there are the real African race is getting completely fucked over by Western imperialism. And we have this archetype of this evil dictator. But, you know, if you look into the alternative stuff on Gaddafi, it seems like he was trying to unite Africa on its own resources, get away from the petrodollar and empower the African race as we would know it. 
And so where are all these bleeding hearts for that while they're <laughs> protesting Western imperialism? And that my point is, we're given all of this archetypal symbolism of this phallic serpent dictator and then this ballerina or whatever conquering this. So they did this all when the sun was going through Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio. And Gaddafi, think about it, the country Libya, Libra, liberate, all these motifs. In esoteric philosophy, it's liberating you from the demiurge, which is represented by the patriarchy of the phallic oppressor. But again, they're using this archetype. So they play it up with Gaddafi. Now, who knows? I don't know if Gaddafi was just in on this and they're putting on a big grand play or show like the hidden hand said. I don't know. But it is interesting how all of these nations have all these dictators that fit this archetype, yet they're trying to break away from international banking or they don't have a bank. They might have a central bank, but it's not tied to these international banking. And it's very interesting. I don't want to go off on a huge tangent here, but if you go back to World War II and all the stuff around that, there's a lot of things that were going on with that regime that were trying to break away from this stuff. And they're the ultimate archetype for the phallic oppressive dictator and Again, I, I mentioned this on the last show. Like I've been through a lot of World War II revisionism stuff, and you know, I, I can't say that I fully ascribe to a lot of that or not. It's, it's it's difficult, but man, there's so much distortion going on in that, and I think that they just keep using these motifs over and over and over again. And the Occupy Libya thing was an as above, so below projection of that because of the constellations going through Virgo through Scorpio during the entire escalation of all of that. And I think that that's one instance where I'm like, dude. They got the fucking occultist signatures written all over this. And I just wonder how much of that was just manufactured for an agenda. And meanwhile, those people many years later are protesting all the Brexit people. And then they're telling everybody the EU and the United Nations are these saintly organizations because they're bringing all these immigrants in and they're all, you know, not being these racist oppressors. Right. Right. <laughs> But those are the organizations that fucked over Libya. The UN <laughs> put sanctions on them. Basically, the hammer of the West, of the military might that everyone is protesting against that represents that demiurge force, is combining with the, the nurturing United Nations. They're sanctioning these countries. And then four or five years later, everyone forgets that. And it's just like they have everyone spinning in these contradictions. And that's what's so hard when I try to explain this stuff to people who are screaming at Brexit people for being racist. And I'm just like... You're just promoting institutions that fucked over the the African people in Africa, you know, and it's right. just they they just kind of look at you like, well, I don't know about that. I'm focusing on this right now. And I'm just like, I can't I can't <laughs> I just have to get away from that conversation because it's just like it's just not going to go anywhere. Hey, man, I hear you. Nothing is genuine. Everything's manipulated. We are being led around by the nose. It is so true. But if I was just going to look at that silver lining, it's that at least we were looking up at the time instead of directing our anger at each other but it's all sleight of hand and celestial puppet strings what are you gonna do but <laughs> man i know that you mentioned taking a break from all this now that the series is done and i hope a lot of listeners will go and digest that series in its entirety is there anything else in the cards for you in terms of this type of research or anything else to tell the listeners about the future yeah I i'd kind of toyed with the notion of starting a Patreon account and seeing if maybe I could have some of this research sink into my work time because I definitely neglected a lot of things during the course of this research. And, you know, again, back to the astrology, I have a lot of Scorpio like tendencies to just dig and be one fixed focus on things and just kind of go crazy with it and neglect my health. And, you know, now I'm looking, I'm, I just think that's a pipe dream. I don't think that that's going to happen. And, wow. you know, I always felt weird about. It's not that I don't I don't have a problem with people getting money for these sorts of things, but I just I just think that I can maybe try to pursue more professional type astrology and and try to do it in a way that is more affordable than I find a lot of astrologers being not not, not to like, you know, shit on people who charge a lot or something, but I'm just saying from my own personal experience. Yeah. I kind of want to go in that direction and 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 try to do it in a way that maybe can help people but try to do it so they help themselves be like, okay, here's what I understand about this. And here's what this might say about this. So let's work with it and, and that kind of thing. And so the research stuff, as I've done it, I might come back to it. I mean, there's so much stuff I wanted to do, like things on 9-11. I know I already did a lot of, on the JFK, but I'm really not very happy with that. 
there's just so much. I, that was my infant stages of learning all this stuff, and I, it was just way, way too much shit going on. So I, I kind of want to do this thing on JFK alchemy of the king and the queen, because the king and the queen and alchemy is like a central motif in specific types of all of these hermetic traditions, like the twelve keys of Basil Valentine and stuff like that. And there's all these weird parallels going on with that and the JFK presidency. So I kind of wanted to maybe center it around that and simplify that series sometime down the road. And, you know, it's just like, when do you have time for that? And so for now I want to focus on this, but also, you know, again, I'm a musician and I really want to get back to focusing on putting a lot of time into that because that's what really, it's very Venusian. It allows me to bridge the gap between all of this esoteric spiritual stuff that I research in isolation from my everyday friends and family that are not looking at any of this stuff. And that's something that I'm able to, you know, write songs about these sorts of things, but it doesn't have to be very overt. It can be more veiled. And then I can still talk with people about it. I can still be excited about it, you know, and that's really the bridge to all of the people in my regular life. And I, I need that. And I, I got away from that in the past three or four years. And, you know, it was probably necessary, but I kind of want to have time for that. And then I'm just reading a butt ton of books on astrology, trying to understand it the best that I can, amalgamating the things that make sense to me and utilizing what I have learned from a lot of this esoteric stuff. And even learning from what the elites seem to do with a lot of these events that's actually helped me understand certain things. So I'm trying to fuse my own version of it and maybe try to release it at some point where I start with just basic birth chart stuff with people. And then maybe I need to learn more about transits and stuff and see if I'm really even into that. And maybe sometime next year I can release that. I don't know. That's my plan because I kind of need to do something that I feel more positive about rather than digging through all this occult stuff and just seeing how fucked up it all is mm -hmm. <laughs> so that that that's the future for me at least as far as i'm planning right now well you've definitely done a lot of work you've stared deep into the abyss definitely take a break and hopefully you do see some benefits of the journey you took but right on man again great job i hope we do put another one of these together a few months down the road because we did leave some things on the table but until then take care my man yeah, for sure. You can talk about this stuff forever. So thanks <laughs> thanks again for having me on. And before we go, I'll just say that our show we did earlier, that really was the catalyst to my channel. It, it brought in so many new people and everyone was really gracious. And I think that that speaks to your audience because I, I got zero trolls from your audience coming nice. over to my channel. And, you know, I got a couple here and there later on. And I even got some transhumanist people coming around the H plus people saying, you know, leaving links saying, if you want to know more about transhuman, like I'm, it's, <laughs> I'm attracting transhumanist promoters, like they, they're looking for it. So I guess maybe you're doing something right. If you're trying to like call that out and you're getting the actual people in the mainstream coming in, trying to, you know, quell your opinions on it <laughs> <laughs> by the skin of my teeth, man, but I'm trying. <laughs> Thanks again for the opportunity. And, and I think that you know, your audience is, is a reflection of the way you approach your show. So thanks again. Right on. Well, too kind, man. And thank you. Take care out there. All right. Thanks, Greg. You got it. Holy hell, people. The triumphant return of Michael Joseph. I think the man does good work. I appreciate his approach in trying to be impartial and trying to be as true to the source material as best he can when relaying these perspectives. And I think I just appreciate him because of that and because I share a similar mindset that these things are so complex and you never really know how genuine the writer is being. So you have to be very careful with the tendency to think that you've got it all figured out. But big thanks to him for going out of his way to digest the hidden hand material so that we could compare and contrast it. Hopefully many of you also found that saga interesting a few years back. I thought it was a good opportunity to build a show around it to a degree trying to do things just a little bit differently. And I really hope Michael does keep working in this wheelhouse. I understand how draining it can be to put out such a body of work and feel like you put so much into it, and you might wonder, for what? Of course, I said that. He didn't say that. But seriously, if you like these subjects, go through his YouTube series. It'll definitely keep you busy until the next Higher Side episode. And I think it deserves a lot of added attention. Schism 206.
tell them you're into it, encourage the guy to keep it up. It's not easy work to do. And there's definitely not enough people doing it, especially ones who can be humble about it. And as for the material itself, I can see the first part that a Garden of Eden situation could be illusionary. It's that whole ignorance is bliss idea. We all know a lot of people who think they're happy in their simple little slave job life, never upsetting the masters. You do stay stagnant living that way. And if you become knowledgeable about the truth of the situation, it definitely affects your blissfulness. But I don't see how the elite's actions match up at all with a desire to inspire or toughen us up tonality. It's a terrible way to inject choice into a society. It just seems like a more obvious form of abuse than the former. But I also get why Michael would be saying that he sometimes sides with the orthodox view. If it's them saying technology is an evil trick, and now the cutting-edge stuff in every field is weaponized against us, vaccines, big pharma, geoengineering, big agrochemicals, and Roundup-resistant crops, television brainwashing, internet surveillance and tracking, add in this creepy, suspicious Wi-Fi signals and 5G stuff, and it's like every field of applied technology is fucking us up. And it's not all bad, right? It's masked. I mean, that's the trick to it. A Renaissance king would be jealous of the conveniences that even the lower class has today. Xboxes, air conditioning, iPhones, cars, airplanes. But it could be the dark agenda that's hidden behind these industries. Some occult adepts greasing the engines. It's hard to say, but we will know if the cycle resets, right? None of it will seem worth it if that day ever comes. It's also like, do you usurp a god because ego gets in the way or because that god is legitimately a tyrant? It's hard to know exactly how the game started, but I can see a perspective where an elite realizes there's a being controlling the construct and wants to rise above it just because their ego can't help itself. Regardless of this entity's feelings about man, man can be an arrogant creature. Also, though, it's hard to not be on Team Human, right? Part of me is like, yeah, break that construct. Figure out what's going on here. But just stop fucking with the other people. You've got to punch up, guys. It's just funny because I'd usually laugh at someone who says we shouldn't play God and has just a super orthodox conservative viewpoint, this anti-science nonsense. Or take the Amish, for example. Like, that's a ridiculous lifestyle. Borderline child abuse. But what if the Amish are the only ones on the Ark 2.0? Or 6.0 for all we know, because they rejected Lucifer's light or helping hand, quote unquote. There are a thousand different ways to look at it, and that's really all we can do, because we aren't steering the ship. Maybe it is all just myth, but it does reflect the times with eerie levels of synchronicity. But maybe that's the power of a good myth, too. But if that smartphone is the mark of the beast, and we all signed up to be willing participants... When the sea levels rise, we got no one to blame but ourselves. But I got the internet to thank for getting me out of that boring rat race 9 to 5, so I guess I'm just going to have to go down with the ship. But folks, it's another long, free show that you got today with an extra hour for Plus members. Join up at the Higher Side Chats Plus.com. It's time you got the full THC experience. If you only heard that first hour, that free portion, there's just nothing like it. It's more. How can it not be better? In the extra hour of this episode, we got into how these esoteric ideas show up in Hollywood movies like The Game and Fight Club, the flaws, inconsistencies, and red flags Michael finds amidst the hidden hand material, the possibility of marginalizing magic and the paranormal and culture to hide a hidden connection to sinister forces, seeding channelers in the alternative community to backdoor particular thoughts and ideas, Michael's personal paranormal experiences, helper beings of the inner earth, symbolism around planets and what that might mean if we take them to represent modes of consciousness, and of course the Dalai Lama, the transhumanist agenda, and the 2045 Avatar project. So I think that's worth $5 alone, but you also, of course, get the full archives, a lifetime forum membership, free downloads of all that higher side music you love so much, and of course, more episodes coming at you every month. 
We got one more episode to go for August that I need to get out tomorrow, but it is a three and a half hour recording that I have to edit up another long one. I think that's four shows this month that went over the two hours. So you are welcome. Show me some love and join the Plus Club. And I'm getting out of here. Your move adept occultists, technology conjurers, and Luciferian light bringers. Your fucking move. I got a new life. You would hardly recognize me. I'm so glad. Now I'm amazing. I don't care about you. Why do I bother when you're not in the club with me?